up narrative for new features in Northern Ireland. Um, we um, will be thinking through the work that they're doing to creatively reimagine those features, um, and they're all making significant contributions in their own communities to reimagine the, the narrative there. So the format of the evening will be that I'm going to introduce the speakers now and hand over to them. They will um, all share for 10 to 15 minutes um, on their work. And then um, we'll just have a really brief discussion amongst ourselves, ask a few questions, and then we really just want to put it out to you. I know that there are a lot of people here in the audience tonight who will be just as informed and just as eager to have a complicated conversation about Northern Ireland as I am. Um, and so just to reiterate as well, you will all have received the house rules. Um, but just bearing that in mind, um, as we open up the conversation, um, we ask that everybody um, just bear in mind um, who else might be in the room and, and also um, not taking up too much space. So if you do talk for a bit, little bit longer, then we think I'll just give you a wave <coughs> and ask you to wind up. I feel like it's a crab, so I know what it's like. Um, so, without further ado, I'll run through each of the speakers, um, their bios, who they are, and um, do that in order, and then we'll, have, then we'll start one after another. So, our first speaker is Malandi O'Hara, um, who's the Deputy Leader of the Green Party in Northern Ireland, um, who's elected to Belfast City Council as a councillor for Castle District Electoral Area breaking through the party's first elected representative in North Belfast, one of the constituencies most affected by the troubles. Malachi studied politics in Birmingham, England, and has worked in community development since his return to Northern Ireland in 2004. An activist and campaigner for almost 20 years, Mal has been deeply involved in queer activism and supported other equality and social justice campaigns. Mal managed health services at Ireland's largest LGBTQ charity for a number of years and has worked extensively in health inequalities in some of the most deprived areas in Northern Ireland. He is the former vice chair of the Equal Marriage Campaign. He is a board member of a local suicide prevention charity in North Belfast since 2012 and last year joined the board of a regional charity working on depression and mental health. Mal has published work on health inequalities amongst LGBTQ people. He is a member of the North Belfast Policing and Community Safety Partnership. We will then hear from Una Malali, is our next our speaker after Mal. Una is a journalist, broadcaster, um, podcaster, screenwriter, and author from Dublin, Ireland. She is a columnist and feature writer for the Irish Times, contributes columns to The Guardian, and her writing has also appeared in The New York Times, Branta, and elsewhere. She was selected by the Online News Association as one of 25 journalists globally from the Women's Leadership Accelerator 2019, and was selected for the European Young Leaders 2019 cohort of Friends of Europe. In 2019, the Republican named her one of 100 women changing the world. She co-hosts the United Ireland podcast with Andrea Horn. She co-founded and co-presented the number one Irish podcast, Don't Stop Repeating, for the duration of the abortion referendum in 2018, and co-founded the Irish Times Women's Podcast. She is the author of In the Name of Love, an oral history of the marriage equality movement in Ireland, and the editor of the anthology Repeal the Eight. As a screenwriter, she collaborates with Sarah Francis as Lucid Lucid, and as a poet has performed her work at numerous Irish festivals. She was the independent chair of Ireland's national LGBTI plus youth strategy in 2018. She lives in Dublin where she is from. Then we'll have Anne Rossiter, who for many people here will need no introduction. That's a bit of a letdown yeah. after that. <laughs> <laughs> we might as well all go home, I think. Anne Rossiter is a long-standing Irish feminist activist and writer who has lived in London since 1961. Since the early 1970s, she's been involved in Irish feminist organisations concerned with women and the Irish national question, such as Women in Ireland and the London Armagh Group. She was a member of the Irish Women's Abortion Support Group from 1980 to 2000, set up to help abortion seekers from Ireland, North and South, 
and has written Ireland's Hidden Diaspora, a history of the group. She has written and performed a one-woman show, making a holy show of myself, has been a member of Speaking of Imelda, the feminist performance art group, and has been involved with Sister Supporter in the struggle to introduce buffer zones outside abortion clinics to protect women from anti-abortion harassment. And finally, this evening, we will hear from Electra LeConte. <laughs> Delighted. <laughs> as controversial as her name, Electra LeConte is a queer drag artist who has made her mark on the Belfast nightlife through her mesmerizing and thought-provoking performances. An activist as well as an entertainer, she rose to international fame by calling out the stigma surrounding HIV at Belfast Pride 2016 by wearing a tiara infused with HIV plus blood to eradicate years of hateful propaganda and educate the community on its transmission. Not shy from speaking her mind, she has faced public bash backlash from members of the DUP, Jim Wells, actually. <laughs> Fighting for queer liberation on the steps of Stormont and Alternative Queer Ulster in 2018. Calling out the bigotry that runs deep within Northern Ireland. She is a prominent star of drag story time, bringing together families to offer children a colourful and vibrant alternative to reading across Northern Ireland. She is the co-producer of the Phenomenal Queertopia, a safe space beyond bars and nightclubs for queer performers to be free to express who they are without judgement. Formed in 2017, this group of fearless queerings has grown beyond expectations <coughs> to the roaring cries of Uffa Queers. <laughs> So I wrote this piece, and over the last few days I got really in my head about it, and um, I got a bit emotional. I lived in England for seven years, I studied in Birmingham. I'm an Anglophile, I love English people and the peoples of England. Um, not so much your establishment, I think, you know, but uh, <laughs> there we go. Um, and that, that's quite interesting for, for me and my background, I'll try and talk a, bit of, a, a little bit about that. Um, so I, I almost wanted to title this, it's more than bloody marriage, right? Um, because I think a lot of our discourse has been absorbed with that issue, particularly in Northern Ireland. I think maybe in other parts of this island, we have moved on. I think you know, there's a really interesting perspective of that in the South as well, since the, the victory in the, in the referendum a few years ago. So I'm gonna talk about some of the key issues, the progress or the stilted progress that we may have made over the last decade in particular. And I'm gonna really focus on so the 2007 when we had a return to assembly, um, at, up until our collapse and this and the numerous crisis that led to that point, um, I think it, it, in terms of any sort of whistle stop discussion about Northern Ireland or queer politics, take it with a, a, a more than a pinch of salt, take it with a, a handful of salt because bear in mind that the speaker may have conscious or unconscious bias. So. Um, I'm 48, I was born in 1979 at the bottom of the Antrim Road. For people who don't know Belfast, um, that's just on the edge of the city centre. Um, and it's an area that people call murder triangle. Around a quarter of the deaths throughout the conflict were within a square mile of that area. My family lived, um, we were, uh, one of my colleagues at Belfast City Council is a guy called Brian Smith, and he's a green councillor too, and he, he lived in the tower blocks in the new lodge. And he always slags me that I lived in the posh part of the new lodge because <laughs> Carlisle Circus was a kind of mixed community. Um, a stone's throw away from the Shankill estate and a stone's throw from the new lodge. Um, and the acronyms people often use are CNR, which is Catholic Nationalist Republican, or PUL, Protestant Unionist Loyalist. They're quite cumbersome and they don't explain the complexity, but they're an easy shorthand to try and give you a sense of, of the communities. Um, that area was mixed um, until the programs and the start of the Troubles in the late 60s. And where I grew up was the, the interface line, is such a place called the Dallas Street. We had a grill on our window, my neighbours were firebombed. They then got a grill on their window. And in 1986 it became too dangerous and my parents moved up to the more affluent Cave Hill area. I'm from an extended working class Catholic Nationalist Republican family in North Belfast. So you can imagine that the conflict is something that we've lived, we understand. You know, and we were players, actors, victims, survivors of that. 
I think in any discussion about queer activist, activism and feminist activism in Northern Ireland, we have to be very conscious of our unique context. So you know, just to capture that, there were 3,600 deaths over the Troubles, and Northern Ireland's less than 3% of the UK total population. So if you scale that up to UK wide, that will be 100,000 deaths. And there were 50,000 casualties. And again, if you scale that up you're, across the UK, you would be talking about 1.65 million casualties of people who were injured or hurt throughout the Troubles. Now, imagine how that permeates the consciousness of the society. In Northern Ireland, we're the poorest region of the UK, and the UK contains the 10 poorest, the most deprived areas of Western Europe. So we're the poorest, poorest part of Western Europe. We have endemic poverty, and that's primarily concentrated in North and West Belfast. But I'll give a shout out, an honourable mention to Derry, because that's where the other, <laughs> and, and Derry ones would kill you if you forget about <laughs> that. It feeds, it feeds that complex. So, um, and you know, 21 years after the signing of the Good for Pretty Agreement, very little shifted. While community relations are a lot better, and there's no real appetite for violence, it does kind of linger there in the background. And we saw it on the streets of Derry in April. My friend, Lyra McKee, was murdered by a dissident terrorist. Um, and we still haven't really progressed on capturing those who have done that, despite some really brave actions by queer and feminist activists in the city to try and call them out and challenge them. So since the Good Friday Agreement, um, it's been stop-start political progress in Northern Ireland. We collapsed in 2002. The Assembly was suspended, didn't return until we had the St Andrews Agreement in 2007. We had the Haas Talks in 2013. We had, I can't believe it's not Haas in 2014, <laughs> the Stormont House Agreement, the Fresh Start Agreement, and they called it the Fresh Start, right? They called it Fresh Start in 2015. We had the in and out DUP ministers when a murder was carried out in Belfast Market Markets area, which was attributed to the IRA. The UUP went into opposition. We had the 2016 election and then Sinn Féin and DUP government when the other parties pulled out. Um, and then our big collapse over ostensibly RHI um, and the cash for our scandal in 2017. But I think if you look at the kind of continuous crisis building up to that point, it's almost like it was coming. And what I think is interesting, people have been watching the last week, is there seems to be a change in mood music and choreography. That I, there seems to be a return to assembly on the horizon. Now, whether that'll be before an election or not, I don't know. But in three years, it'll be three years in January since we had an assembly. Mm -hmm. In Northern Ireland, we spend less than other parts of the UK on mental health. Mm -hmm. And according to the Royal College of Psychiatrists, we have a 25% higher rate of mental illness than England. We only had another suicide prevention strategy published a couple of months ago. The previous one expired in 2015. Mm -hmm. So three years without a suicide prevention strategy. And we haven't had a mental health promotion strategy from 2008. That really gives us a challenge to what sort of impetus are they putting around addressing issues of mental health and well-being. And I know that is going to talk about that as well. And here's what's really shocking. Since the Good Friday <coughs> Agreement, there have been 4,500 deaths recorded by suicide. More people have died in the last 20 years by suicide than died throughout the conflict. What is the real crisis in our community? I think. You know, we're beginning to sense that we're a post-traumatic stress society, but we've barely really began to understand that or grapple with it. And I would say there's intergenerational trauma, and feminist commentators would be much better positioned than me to talk about the machismo that laced the conflict and the outworking of that in terms of women being excluded from peace building and greater incidents of domestic and sexual violence. Surprisingly, we had a lot of creative ambiguities in the Good Friday Agreement, things that they just couldn't grapple at the time, so they kind of left it on the long finger or, or didn't really pose a solution, and vi Victims and Legacy is one of that. Thankfully, there has been movement in the last year, and I don't think people, you know, the they Government Formation Bill, which gave us a portion of marriage rights, um, attached to that was also a pension for survivors and victims. That's currently out for consultation, but what that looks like is that um, those, it's on a sliding scale of how disabled you were by the incident that took place, 
and it's a pension of up to ten thousand pounds a year. <coughs> and the reason that was frustrated for so long is because certain inter certain parties, particularly the DUP and some elements of Ulster Unionism, did not want what they call paramilitary actors to be able to benefit from the pension. It suggests that there are less than double figures of people who would be paramilitary actors who would benefit from the pension. So for that very small number of people, the pension was held up. Um, and, and, and that's a real, real difficulty because a lot of these people were injured or hurt at the very start of the troubles and they're maybe old or they're very ill and they've struggled all their life. So hopefully we'll see progress on that. We have a crisis in our healthcare system. I just want to give you a couple of lines on that and that's We've had five health ministers since 2007, I think. They spent a lot of time too busy blocking queer and feminist um, progress rather than paying attention to the urgent needs within healthcare. In England, there are 1,154 people waiting for more than a year for planned care. In Wales, it's 4,176. In Northern Ireland, it's 120,201 people. Now, we're 3% of the UK population, but that's how, how much of a crisis our waiting list is. So how is that relevant? I think in the discourse around addressing our issues, while the rest of these islands were maybe having the conversation about um, queer liberation and feminist um, liberation, we were locked in conflict. So these issues didn't really get into the wider political discourse. The feminist and queer groups were getting on with it on the ground and trying to make progress. <coughs> particularly give kudos to women's groups in terms of uh, building peace at the interface. Since the Good Friday Agreement, almost all of our queer equality legislation has come through either the courts or UK-wide. Stormont's sum total of equality movement has been changing the lifetime ban on men who have sex with men to a one-year deferral. That's what Stormont can say it's done for queer liberation. And the paucity, I think, is, is, is you know, the same in terms of gender equality. Part of that is around the Petition of Concern and the way our structures are set up. For those who don't know, the Petition of Concern is a mechanism that was designed to prevent majoritarianism, primarily from the, the unionists against nationalists, but it's actually been repeatedly abused. From the 2011 to 15 mandate, it was used 115 times mostly by the DUP, 86 times by them. Um, it was used five times to block marriage motions, but it was also used to prevent censure of ministers, investigation of ministers. And admittedly, um, we Greens signed it on a couple of occasions, one about welfare reform and the other was the block, the closure, a, an attempt to close Mary Stokes, which was providing abortion access in Northern Ireland. The key mechanism for addressing queer equality would be a sexual orientation strategy and an inclusive gender strategy. They were promised in 2007. They were promised again in 2011. A consultation took place in 2014, but we're really great at doing consultations and they're burying them, and that's been buried. And in the 2016-17 programme for government for the DUP and Sinn Féin, there was no mention of a sexual orientation strategy. Our legislation around equality is underpinned by Section 75. So, and in fact, when it was brought in as part of the Good Friday Agreement, we were ahead of the rest of these islands for the first time. Fantastic, <laughs> we're ahead on equality. Um, now, they surpassed this with the single equality bill in the rest of the UK in 2010. But the Section 75 has two elements. One is good relations, and the other is equality of opportunity. So equality of opportunity is across nine grounds. But good relations is three grounds and it puts a statutory duty to promote good relations between people of different political opinions, different races, and different community backgrounds. Then we have this kind of in-between group, which is the hate crime categories. So we know that hate's committed against those three grounds in good relations, but also disability and also trans identity. But we've no duty to promote good relations despite those people experiencing hate, and that's a real anomaly. And the challenge is that our, our Quality Commission does not support extending that currently. The other thing is that the Section 75 duty does not apply to schools. And that's a real civil problem. If we're going to address a lot of these issues, particularly around queer equality, schools are going to be the key mechanism for that. We lobbied for a, 20, for a bullying bill throughout the previous mandates. Eventually it came. We actually, I was working for the Rainbow Project at that time, and we had to call 
Sinn Féin, who held the education ministry for nine years, we called them partitionists, so that really stung when they didn't like it. Um, they brought a great anti-bullying bill in the south, but apparently there was no need for one in the north. Um, eventually they did bring one, um, but the central mechanism would have, it would have obliged schools to record bullying according to the section 75 categories. That was removed, so schools just report bullying rather than homophobic or racist or sexist or, or whatever disability bullying, which would mean we have the data, and when we have the data, we can begin to address it. For trans communities, um, I'm not a, I'm a cisgender gay man, um, but one of the key things that has been an upsurge in the number of young people protecting access and support, but no new people have been, uh, been able to access support, I think from April 2018 a year and a half, and we know the impact that accessing that type of gender identity support has for people. It's just about saving lives, so that's a real issue. For queer women, IVF was extended across the rest of the UK in 2013, but surprise, surprise, not in Northern Ireland. So in Northern Ireland, <coughs> queer women and women are allowed to access one cycle of IVF, where the rest of the UK it's three cycles, and it gives clarity on access to that for queer women. Outburst arts and people in the arts community are, this is a, a sort of silver lining, are on their 13th year. And it's a, it's a queer arts festival, and it's unashamedly called a queer arts festival. And that's been going from strength to strength in Northern Ireland. We did get momentous changes in October. Um, and I think what's really notable is when that happened in July and it came through in the 21st of October with no return to assembly, the opposition didn't talk about marriage. They effectively gave up, but they focused all their ire on blocking abortion access. And you know, my understanding of homophobia and transphobia is that it's rooted in sexism and patriarchy leads those isms um, and that discrimination against our communities. Now, that's kind of a whistle stop of where we are. And I would say it looks like even the most conservative forces in unionism are moving on these issues. And there's some things that have been really heartening over the last few months for me. In September, there was a protest about closing Harlan and Wolf. And the Harlan and Wolf shipyard workers were at Stormont. And who was protesting on the same day but Irish language rights activists? And the shipyard workers protested and shouted in Irish, save our shipyards. So some sort of cross-pollinization of, of solidarity was really good to see. The other upcoming sort of ray of hope for me is this next generation. They're not tolerating our bullshit on climate change and our, fail, our failure to address it. And they, they intrinsically link that issue of climate justice with other equality and social justice rights. And I believe they will save this world because I think we have it. Um, so when and if we have a, a return to assembly, and I don't necessarily, I think we will, but I'm not 100% sure, I have a long list of a queer agenda of what I want to see, right? So it's inclusive sex ed and the curriculum change. It's queer alliances in every school, no exemption because of your faith or your doctrine. Teacher training, hate crime review, which is currently underway, and I want to see trans, hate crime codified in that, and I want to see expand, expanded to gender. I want to see an ending of employment exemptions. I want a sexual orientation and gender identity strategy, or gender inclusive strategy. I want queer representation in decision making and politics. I want a blood ban that's based on risks. I want access to PrEP and PEP. I want IVF access. I want a gender identity review and healthcare. In those battles, I'd be asking for solidarity from across the water and it's been coming for years and I want to see it continue. And I want to say to finish, as Martha P. Johnson said, I want my gay rights and I. Of the repeal and marriage equality movements in the Republic of Ireland, 
um, and my increasing discomfort about how that progress is being co-opted by neoliberal forces who are creating it as a veneer to sell back to um, uh, the global capital forces that are uh, disrupting the quality of life in Ireland and my own participation in that and the complexity around the guilt of participating in those things as a member of the media establishment and as a product of middle class social engineering. Oh. <laughs> um, but I thought instead uh, <laughs> that I would just talk about some things that I'm feeling in this context. Uh, so in 1983, <clears throat> a lot happened in Ireland. Um, it's also the year I was born. Uh, it's also when the black American documentary maker St. Clairborne released The Black and the Green, which was a documentary on a fact-finding trip to Belfast where five black American civil rights activists went to the north and they met with members of the Republican movement. And there's one scene where Reverend Herbert Daughtry of the National Black United Front speaks with Paddy Lockhart of Sinn Féin. And he says, those of us who have been here have been very moved by the striking similarities between Irish here and blacks, our struggle. And Daughtry says, our resiliences, our humour, our kindness, but in the States, Irish and blacks do not have a history of getting <coughs> on together. And Paddy Locker responded saying, Irish people in America try to say that they are better than black people. When people left Ireland originally to go to America, it was during the famine, and they were completely oppressed by the British. They had to move out during starvation and oppression to America. They went out there and started the exact same thing the British were doing to them, trying to be little people because of the color of your skin. You'll always get antagonizers who, to benefit themselves, will cause trouble. In this country, it's between Catholics and Protestants. It's the same in the States or South Africa between black and white people. This is a thing that us in the Republican movement would love to get rid of, things that are splitting the people. And in the scene, Daughtry nods really enthusiastically and he says, it's critical now. The right wing racist conservative forces have captured the seats of power. They are more blatant. What that has done in the US is brought ever increasing unemployment and poverty. You've got militarism, support for fascist regimes across the world. If there were ever a time that people of goodwill needed each other, now is the time. Because if we don't find each other, these people who constitute the rulership of the United States and other Western countries are going to blow up the world. 1983. Paddy Lochran incidentally was murdered uh, nine years later, in 92, by an OEC officer uh, who walked into the Sinn Féin press office on the Falls Road, called, posing as a journalist, and shot three men dead, including Paddy, Pat McBride, and Michael O'Dwyer, whose two year old son was sitting on his lap at the time and was somehow uninjured. Repetition, the same arguments, and how predictable, of course, someone from Dublin opening with the troubles. <laughs> of course, what I'm actually opening with is the solidarity of oppressed people. Empathy is a Venn diagram. It's about common ground, and I want to be honest. One thing I've done my whole life is try to tackle my xenophobia towards English people, which is ongoing, both the xenophobia and the tackling. <laughs> I think it's important to talk about our own xenophobia and our own racism and our own misogyny. I think it's important to talk about the romanticism I wrap up in the solidarity between African Americans and Irish Catholics when I do so without even acknowledging my whiteness while I was speaking about that how I benefit from that, how I'm talking about this noble connection across the Atlantic without even positioning myself as a white, middle-class cis woman who has benefited from the structural racism and mechanisms of white supremacy globally. I appreciate the honesty that's going to be created in this room tonight because honesty can be radical and dangerous and healing and hurtful. I am wary of safe spaces and not in a cunty way I only believe in safe spaces if there is a necessity for safety, if, for example, there is a cohort of people who are particularly vulnerable, which can happen all the time. Otherwise, I like stepping into, into brave spaces. Sarah Shulman wrote, conflict is not abuse. Maybe, maybe not. 
When I speak with my friends and colleagues and acquaintances in the North, I create a safe space between us. I've done that my whole life, and I've done it through avoidance. And I've been wrong to do that. A thing happened to me this year. When I was having a pint with a friend of mine from Northern Ireland, who I've known for years, we've traveled together, we hang out together, we meet up every time, pretty much. He's in Dublin, and I'm in Belfast, where he lives. And he was in Dublin on this occasion. And it was in the middle of one of the Brexit shit shows. I can't remember which one. <laughs> and he expressed to me his surprise that the Dublin taxi driver he had encountered early that day was worrying about what would happen to the North, as Westminster increasingly abandoned it throughout this process that we've been going through the last three and a half years. And as he began talking, my friend, I became acutely aware that this was the first time we had ever discussed politics. Isn't that insane? <laughs> but everyone down here is freaking out about the North, I said. Do you not know that? And he kind of looked at me a bit weirdly and said, I just assume no one gives a fuck about us. <laughs> and he's not wrong to assume that. Because even, I'm, even though I'm his friend, the care I was taking to make sure we never discussed politics ever, so obviously came across as me having no investment in his life. No concern for his context and no care about what happened to his future in that context. I thought I was taking care, but that's not how, not how it was being received. How could anyone think you give a fuck about something if you never talk about it? When I'm tense, I close up. When I'm scared of stepping on people's toes, I stop moving anywhere. My throat chakra, whose color is blue, contracts <laughs> and constricts. When I flew over the Irish Sea this morning, I wondered where they put the border. <laughs> <laughs> a line of pirate radio ships, maybe. A coral reef. Yes. Why not? The sea is already blue and green and white. I saw the crest of waves and foam and imagined schools of distant whales heaving their way through currents on their way to swallow us all in the bellies of beasts. We have pretended to construct a safe space in an unsafe world. We have pretended to construct a safe space in a hostile world. We have pretended that neoliberalism is progress. We have pretended that capitalism is successful. We have pretended that leadership is necessary. We keep having the same conversations, the same arguments, the same fights, the same campaigns, because we aren't actually talking honestly about how we feel. We're being too safe and we're afraid to be wrong. People in the Republic celebrated marriage equality and abortion rights before our siblings in the North got to. And we wanted a rest after we won those things. <laughs> and we'd get around to the other stuff in a bit, but just give us a minute. <laughs> How gross. I didn't do as much as I should have for my siblings in the North on those campaigns. And I felt so shite when what I did do was met with so much gratitude. When I um, transferred the royalties for my last book to abortion campaigns in the North and it was accepted with so much appreciation, I felt so guilty. What even are these places that we're living in? What if Northern Ireland is actually trans? What if it is a trans state? What if the North is non-binary? What if it came out? I want to talk about a book called I Choose Elena by Lucia Osborne Crowley. It was published this year. You should buy it. Although it is about sexual assault, so it's, you know, it's not an easy read. But here is something she writes. In the course of my recovery, I've thought a lot about the nature of shame how it is forced upon us by others, how it feels so personal but never belonged to us in the first place. 
Once, sitting on a plane on my way to visit my sister and her new life in London, I stumbled upon a lecture by social scientist Brené Brown about the difference between shame and guilt, and it felt as though some fundamental truth about myself crystallized in one fell swoop. She continues. Guilt and shame are profoundly different emotions. Guilt is the feeling that you have done something bad. Shame is the feeling that you are bad. Guilt is internally constructed, based on our knowledge of ourselves and the recognition that our behavior has deviated from the self. Shame, on the other hand, is given to us by others. Shame is inorganic. Guilt says, I made a mistake. Shame says, I am a mistake. The book, as I said, is about the aftermath of sexual assault and how she realized that her shame from that was actually the guilt of her attacker being processed through her. She writes, this is known in trauma literature as a lack of self-leadership. When a person's development is defined by or interrupted by violence, they become unable to develop a clear sense of self. This is because their interiority, their capacity to make decisions, to understand what they want and don't want in the world, can only develop in an environment of safety. It is only in safe places that they can look inward. When their lives are beset by violence, they do not have that luxury. There is no Irish guilt. There is only Irish shame. Yeah. What if Irish shame is actually English guilt? We're forced to process on England's behalf. Their behalf. Them, they. The transness of the other, the transness of us. We can't keep having the same conversations. We are having the same conversations. We are doing the same activism. We are fighting the same battles. If we are going to default to repetition, let's say something honest. I hate you. I love you. I want to be you. I never wanted you. I am you. You are me. When I'm in London, as I am quite regularly, I feel patronized and insecure. I am processing the guilt you don't even know you have, and it becomes my shame I'm confused for feeling. I start to lose my confidence, but then I think there is no such thing as losing confidence. There is only gaining vulnerability. I am gaining vulnerability. I am a feeling person in a hostile world, <coughs> pretending it's a safe space. If we are so vulnerable, then we are so strong. If we are so strong, then why don't we rise? We don't need leaders. Leaders are in pain. They are working out their traumas by trying to ascend to power. We are the powerful ones. Powerlessness is our power. me over that between 1970 and 2015 60,000 Northern Irish women came to our shores here to seek safe and legal abortions. It's a titchy little place as you said, tiny, it's just that number uh, is overwhelming and to be honest I think I've run into one or two <laughs> over the years. Um, to the degree that I can say that I learned about Northern Ireland through the lens of women coming and staying in the house uh, in a very domestic situation that really wasn't a domestic situation at all. It was in many ways the kind of things you talk about, all the unsaid things. 
And are people finding it so difficult, especially if they came from a non-Catholic background? Dear God, I'm not a Catholic, but I can't go around with the flag saying I'm not a Catholic, I'm not anything really, I don't know what I am, to be honest. Even hitting 80, I don't know yet, but I'll find out. <laughs> However, I was trying to um, ease up the situation a bit. You were a knockout, did you know that? <laughs> I knew it the minute I met you. You had to talk about the brains. But anyway, uh, Maliki, you were saying, and you were saying uh, as well, about solidarity. Um, yes, there has been solidarity over the years, lots of it, and given unreservedly, and but with much shame on my part. Shame about the North, shame that I knew nothing about the North until I came here. And to be honest, I learned more about the North through the women staying in the house than I ever knew about it, even on the marches and all the various groups during the, the troubles from the very beginning, because we were there in 1972. I was youngish then and um, could do a proper day's work. But anyway, I wanted to pay some kind of credit to all the groups and all the women who've given solidarity, and some men too. And I'm looking at one down there who used to be the driver. In the early hours of the morning, he would take off, because I used to drive on principle. You've got to do the driving, I do enough. Um, driving to clinics when women were feeling sick in the early mornings. Can you imagine what it was like at six o'clock in the morning? So your man here, my partner of nearly 50 years, uh, was the driver. I used to think of driving Miss Daisy. Sorry folks, I'm trying to lighten the mood a bit. I hope you don't mind. <laughs> That's what I do. So I'd love to give credit and to um, extend their solidarity as well to the people of Northern Ireland. Uh, the women of the Irish Women's Abortion Support Group and one of the founders right there at the back, Marion, hello, Marion Larrigy. <laughs> Lots of us have turned out tonight. Array is an important organisation, I can see. Uh, so we had the Irish Women's Abortion Support Group for 20 years. Can you believe? We had lots of fights, but mostly we kept away from the sectarian thing. It was really the only group that I could say that um, those of us from Catholic and from non-Catholic, Protestant, whatever, Presbyterian backgrounds, we just got on with the work. And the work was supporting women in whatever they needed. We tried to raise money, and we did a fair bit. We even had lesbian Haley's. In Irish centers. In Irish centers. And they never knew till they saw the dungarees. <laughs> they never knew. They never knew. Uh, and that seemed to be a symbol of womanhood liberated. And they cottoned on. Even uh, then they were watching for necking and things like that. <laughs> uh, I won't talk about that now. So anyway, the Irish Women's Abortion Support Group, 1980 to 2000. And um, also the picture you had, Emma, of um, you know the Irish Women United. Do you remember when you gave out the picture first? Marion is in it. From, so we go back a long way. Then we had, of course, many other organizations. The Abortion Support Network came into being and is still in being and is doing a far more professional job than we ever did. Uh, as Mara, you know, is an American who, who runs it, Mara Clark, and she's very um, professional altogether. And now the services are extending more and more to Polish women and to um, women from Gibraltar and from Malta. So we're getting those coming now much more. So good on you. Solidarity was always also extended, but only to the Republic this time with LIAR. That's the London Irish Abortion Rights Campaign, a sister organization of ARC in Dublin. And they were highly successful in, as you know, getting ultimately extension of the 67 Act and more without the criminalization element to it. Um, 
We've had many, many other organizations, including Rosa, and I thought it was important to mention Rosa because she, the organization represents Rosa Luxemburg, which, who you know was a great revolutionary in the 19th century, a woman of our times now, and she was founder of the German Communist Party, and we know what happened there. Uh, there was Voice for Choice as well, which was much more a parliamentary type group, and Women on Web, the women who got together and are based in uh, Amsterdam, mm -hmm. I think it is. And there's another organization as well, and I couldn't remember, at my age, I can't remember the name of anything. Uh, another organization that uh, ensures that women get pills on the internet, even if clandestinely, and that they're safe, because there are an awful lot of dogs online. Um, and we have Sister Supporter as well, another organization that looked out for Irishwomen and many others. As we know, there are two, he three here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Supporter. <laughs> uh, having a vigil outside the abortion clinics and in Ealing, successful in getting a buffer zone. And I swear, I'm sure you've read all about that in the press. And we can't forget the abortion providers either. That's BPAS and Mary Stokes in particular. They always went the extra mile for Irish women. Really, they did, even if sometimes people said it was a bit patronizing. But look, you'd rather it that way than the other way, complete and utter neglect. And of course, we have Imelda, and Imelda will be speaking. The personification of Imelda will be speaking in a while. But anyway, to get back to my little bit, uh, and I'll make it quick because Helena and I are sharing uh, the time here. Um, I'm thinking, are we history? Now that the deed is done, even if there's still an awful lot to do, are we history? Are people like us that I've mentioned here, uh, are we all defunct? So what's left to do and what solidarity do we need doing? Because we can do it. We've done it. All that work in the Irish Women's Abortion Support Group occurred during the Troubles. You have no idea how difficult it was at times. It was just difficult often to know what to talk about. Can you imagine? Especially if people came from a lawyer's background and they immediately knew from my, my accent, of course, that, that I'm deep south. Absolutely, and presumably in their view of the world, a Catholic and possibly even a Thai. I don't know. So anyway, um, is it all bunk now? Where do we go from here? The fact that this clandestine run between Ireland and England the feminine channel across the water that everyone just didn't know about, except that they did. Listen here, everyone knew. And what they didn't know, they made up. You only had to go and see your sister in London and you were definitely going for an abortion, at least where I come from, anyway. Can I have a drink of water? It's a um, problem, as you get um, a little older, shall I say. Anyway, um, the stories that we've accumulated, those forbidden stories of both Irish states hijacking women's bodies, their fertility, these stories, they map the suppression of the feminine experience across every townland of Ireland. But most importantly, seeing the discussion or the presentations that they've been so far, they are important in trying to understand the interrelationship between um, British women and Irish women because we work very closely with British women and there is a relationship. A lot of things are unspoken, but there's a lot of solidarity. Even more important is understanding the relationship that has developed because of this work. Uh, between Southern Irish women and Northern Irish women. I've got to know Irish women in the North through this. How else? This is very close to the bone, <coughs> this kind of work. Yes, it was true during the strip searches, that was very close to the bone, and we did a lot at that time. 
But this particular work is very close to the bone. It's very domestic. It's very in your face. You've got to fiddle around. What am I going to say? Fatal, fetal abnormality for women who come with such a condition are to me a nightmare. I, I'm not able to cope with it. But they need somewhere to stay. There's a lot of money that had to be and still needs to be spent. Some women are spending £2,000 if you go to St. Mary's in Paddington, and um, that money is raised by ASN, and we put the bill at home, and he does the driving as her, <laughs> right? So I thought that it would be good. I don't know. I would read one of the short stories I write when I've got a few minutes. Uh, I do the short story route, and I was even thinking of re- um, um, what's the word? But, um, getting back into the saddle to do some more of making a holy show of myself. I had a feeling that maybe there's a space in London uh, to try and do something with the Irish organisations who still, I'm talking about the two Irish centres and many others, who uh, don't even want to show a film, as far as I know, about Imelda, for instance. <coughs> We're that backward, and uh, it, it's something needs to be done. And I thought if I became a Shanaki, and why not? I wasn't going to set myself up as peg sayers or anything like that. I was going to be an awful lot more risque than that. Yeah. So anyway, making a holy show of myself is <coughs> resurrected tonight. Yeah. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to read you this story. I think I might have to sit You're down. Do you mind? Um, I'm only, I think I'm only five foot one now. I've got so short. It's kind of difficult holding on to all of it. This is a story called, and, and apologies for those who've read it or heard it already, but it's one about engagement between women from north and south, myself and another woman and her daughter. It's called, sure, we're all paddies over here. <laughs> yes, we are. A fraught phone call from Heathrow at around 9 a.m. intrudes on a leisurely Saturday breakfast and newspaper reading session. A hysterical voice in a strong Northern Ireland accent says, someone needs to get to the airport and quick. Sorry, I can't do the accent. Me and me, we daughter, are being <coughs> held here, she says, in a rush. They're holding us under the PTA, the Prevention of Terrorism Act. And they say we need someone to vouch for us. After a strong intake of breath, the woman gives her name and haltingly explains that she brought her daughter to London for an abortion and they were being held. This is a new one for the listener. For years, as a member of IWAS, the Irish Women's Abortion Support Group, um, she had dealt with rape and incest scenarios and all manner of crises facing women who decided to terminate their pregnancies. She has known of cases where abortion seekers missed their flights, having been held up in roadblocks during the orange marching season or following IRA bombs in the north. But this case takes the biscuit. It certainly puts a new twist on what we euphemistically call the troubles. After putting the phone down, the IWAS woman takes off at speed to catch the Piccadilly line tube for Heathrow. She proceeds a pace. Yeah, great. She proceeds a pace and along the seemingly endless corridor. I don't know if this you'll have it, but there was a long corridor then, um, to the airport, from the tube that is. Good for the figure, always good for the figure for me, and for the blood pressure, she muses as she finally arrives at the information desk in Terminal 1. She decides she must act calmly and decisively. Where can I find out about two women on a flight from Belfast being detained here under the PTA, she says, to the receptionist at the desk? Maybe it's the airport police I need. The woman doesn't answer at once, since it's hardly one of the 10 or so most common questions she's posed on a daily basis. Covert looks with her colleagues, 
are expressed while passing the details of the inquiry and the inquirer's ID down the line. Not surprising really, since for the duration of the Troubles and even beyond, the general profile of all Irish people in Britain has been suspicious. Good job I remember to bring my passport then, jokes the Irish woman, trying to ease the tension. She gets a blank look in response, I'm surprised. Finally, the Iowa's woman comes face to face with a police officer and explains at least twice over what she'd come for. Once again, she's asked to confirm her identity. Her passport ID is cross-checked with her driving license and credit cards. The policeman seems to have difficulty figuring out the purpose of the detainee's visit. What do you mean they're here for an abortion, he argues, clearly unaware of the fact that abortion is to all intents and purposes illegal in Northern Ireland as it is in the Republic, and that many thousands of Irish women pass through the airport each year to exercise their, their reproductive rights, albeit across the water. The policeman describes this state of affairs as quaint, when in fact he means archaic. For him, <coughs> proof of Catholic, curiously he doesn't mention Protestant, Ireland's unwillingness to, to make an accommodation with women's rights and its prediction, predilection for dumping its so-called problems on dear old Blighty. The Iowas woman decides that rather than have a Barney about history, politics, religion, and the finer points of the colonial experience, <laughs> uh, which have got the Irish into this morass, she'd better do something positive and get these women out of a fix. Mustering as much gravitas as her five foot three will allow, she um, keeps reminding him that he could verify the facts by simply ringing the clinic. This neither he nor his colleagues have so far been minded to do, not until then. After a long wait, two ashen-faced women are released from detention. Over a cup of tea, the mother tells how they boarded the first flight out of Belfast that morning and were de detained as they passed through passport control at Heathrow. The only explanation offered by the police for their detention was that they appeared agitated and looked fishy in their black leather jackets. She'd got the IWAS telephone number from a friend who'd been in a spot of bother. That explained a lot at the time, as she described it, and kept in a case of emergency. The daughter remained silent throughout, rather disturbing, clearly traumatized by the ordeal. The mother repeats over and over to me, but I kept telling them, the police that is, that we're from, and she mentions a fiercely loyalist area of Belfast that I knew about. Don't they know we're not IRA? Don't they know we're not British? They just don't get it. Without really thinking, the Iowas woman replies, of course they don't, sure, we're all paddies over here. Her accent, my accent, is unmistakably deep south, signaling loyal, uh, alien territory to a loyalist. But the mother just blinks and decides to say nothing, knowing that needs must when the devil drives in any case, the contradictions are too many. Decided to take action from our diaspora vantage points. 
Following mission meetings, we sought out intergenerational knowledge, contacting the legendary Anne Russell. <laughs> 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 we take our hats off to you. <laughs> <laughs> In collaboration with Anne, we established a meeting on the 5th of December 2013 to invite involvement in the speaking of Imelda, which uh, we saw as a direct action feminist performance group, mm -hmm. merging performance with activism throughout its existence between 2013 and 2018. Imelda did exactly what it said on the tin. It was my personal pleasure to work with each of the Meldas over that time, including Anna, Sarah, and Sorsha, uh, who joined me tonight. Importantly, Melda retrieved the work of past London Irish reproductive rights campaigners while activating new forms of creative collaborative activism. So we referenced the work of Irish Women's Abortion Support Group, that Dan was just speaking about, and former members of uh, Ayahuasca, Anne and Marion Lardy, down there somewhere, uh, joined our ranks. Our title reclaimed the girl's name, Melba, used by Ayahuasca as a code word for abortion to speak of Ireland, making England the legal destination for abortion. Our use of red clothing recalled how Ayahuasca members sometimes wore a red skirt so as to be identifiable to uh, women they were collecting at airports and at stations. And this is also referred to in the work of uh, Siobhan Clancy, another brilliant uh, uh, activist. Uh, feminist activist artists have often used costume to reference legacies of activism. activism. Current scheme notes that Candice Markovich <laughs> Uh, participant in the 1916 Rising and first woman elected to Westminster Parliament placed an ostrich plume <laughs> uh, in her hat to establish a connection with uh, earlier militant women. Steele records Markovich described a mysterious woman who rode with the French army that wore a red plume in her hat and also recalled Molly Weston who wore the United Irishmen's cockade in her hat. As Steele outlines, Markovich's costume was not merely demonstrative of her theatrical uh, uh, flair. So recalling Joan of Arc, Queen Maeve, and warrior women, the Red Countess, it is also noted, had a penchant for drag. Um, as a raised exhibition outlines, it's a fantastic exhibition, contemporary activist artists continue to creatively harness costume and mythology in innovative ways to advance uh, progressive change. And so we're just going to briefly touch on uh, some of the things Melda did. So the Meldas um, have also adopted and parodied many roles, including in our own small way, we were a relatively small group, <laughs> uh, to demonstrate our solidarity with reproductive rights activists in uh, Northern Ireland. So in 2014, we ambushed the then British Secretary of State for Health, Mr. H Hunt, at his advice for the surgery in a Sainsbury's supermarket. Like Eve's escape from Eden, we handed him apples that contained legal advice on making it easier for Northern Irish citizens to access abortion. We informed him. <laughs> It's time to upset the patriarchal apple cart. <laughs> <laughs> in, in 2015, we honest, unexpectedly wowed the WOW Festival uh, in London by performing a political pageant to raise awareness amongst feminists that abortion remained illegal in Northern Ireland. And it's quite surprising that sometimes people didn't uh, know that. They didn't know. Yeah. As our Miss Northern Ireland, uh, Tina McLaughlin, banged Virgin Mary holy water bottles on a drum. We chanted, We are not second class citizens left to rot. In, uh, in 2016, with our Northern Irish radical Sorsha, <laughs> um, we visited the British Passport Office and the Northern Irish Executive to ask what use a Northern Irish passport was to those needing an abortion. 
on setting her passport in flames, uh, sort of uh, convicted it was. Neither use nor ornament. <laughs> <laughs> And in uh, 2016, we performed the game of shame in Parliament Square in response to the prosecution of a woman in Northern Ireland for buying the abortion pill, highlighting the limited options afforded those needing an abortion, we declared. The game is up, and enough is enough. Stop gambling with women's lives. Our, our bodies, bodies are our choice. choice. And in 2000, uh, July 2016, Anna Carnegie, here, and myself attended the first rally for Joyce in Belfast, dressed as super heroes, replete with capes and underwear as outerwear. <laughs> we stuck uh, stickers on marchers, honoring them all as heroes for choice. <laughs> In July, oh, sorry, in June 2017, following the general election in which the DUP took center stage, uh, we supported Northern Irish member Tina McCluskey as she organized a protest outside Downing Street. Showing solidarity with Alliance for Choice, we proclaimed, We will not be Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and thanks to the hard graft, the courage, and the participation, Persistence of activists in Northern Ireland, we were not. We take our hats off to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Everyone saw and the real me. 
The real me tried to be the real me in a lot of situations when I was a child, but each time I was loud, flamboyant, and feeling fabulous, my peers let me know that this behavior was not welcome. The only thing it did welcome was pain, sometimes physical, mostly psychological, because I had to hide who I was because just that. I was who I was and didn't equate to people's ideals of how a boy should act and should be. So my private life is precious to me because I'm wired to believe that I should have a private life so separate from my normal life because I've had to hide aspects of my personality in order to survive. So I don't get attacked or mocked or tokenized. It's why being a drag queen can be so safe because no one really knows the real me. The me who is so used to hiding. Because people also listen to drag queens as well. With the gender fuckery of our communities, big, loud, and colorful, and alongside the trans people of color, drag queens were thrust into the political act activism sphere through the Stonewall riots, which helped create the gay liberation movement. This deep tradition of drag being used for political activism is something that appealed to someone like me, who grew up in an inherently political environment where your life's choices were made a few based on whether you were Catholic, Protestant, Unionist, or Nationalist. As I say, identity politics and Northern Ireland go hand in hand, and here I am having my own identity crisis, and I can use and yield that to my own advantage. I can say things in drag, be protected by it, and still people will listen to what I have to say. However, the art form cannot be expected to express the complicated class, racial, and gender divisions experienced by distinct queer groups, since drag remains largely a cisgender male pursuit whose professional echelons requires lots of free time and money. But drag is powerful, topical, political, and we are on the front line of our communities. So what I was saying had to be worthwhile and it had to change things. Which brings me to one of those times in my life where everything did change. Pride Week 2018. I was, for the second year in a row, reading to children in the East Belfast Library on the Saturday launch of Belfast Pride Week at an event dear to my heart, uh, Drag Storytime. That evening I was going to be one of 20 queer individuals speaking at Stormont Parliament Buildings at the first Alternative Queer Ulster event organized by Malachi O'Hara and the Green Party. Days before the event was due to take place, I received a message from a reporter from a local newspaper, the Belfast on the Run, <laughs> asking me to contact them for a sound bite for that Saturday Stormont event. Believing in integrity over infamy, I told her no, because her newspaper publishes transphobic and homophobic rhetoric of GDP members, and that's impossible. <laughs> so why would I give her anything to profit from? I was unaware at the time that she was in contact with Jim Allister of the TV, with the newspaper running a story with my big, beautiful face across the page, igniting a war between myself and Mr. Allister for me daring to speak in the steps of Stormont, especially because of who I am and what I have done. At Belfast Pride 2016, I wore a tiara coated in HIV positive blood as a symbol of defiance against the stigma imposed upon those who are living with HIV. Mm -hmm. Woo! Yeah. My message was to educate those around me of the transmission of the disease. Some members of the DEP do not know that heterosexual people can get HIV, <laughs> so I thought my message was necessary. <laughs> it's Trevor Clark. <laughs> Name dropping all the night. <laughs> Jim Allister called me disgusting, demanding that I not speak at the event. So suddenly the private life that my queerness had been forced upon me was being pulled into the spotlight because I was being too queer. I still spoke at the event, <coughs> trying to stop me. <laughs> Which only caused more of an uproar for the members of the DEP who believed that I was evangelizing people into a way of alternative living, as well as being foul-mouthed. <laughs> My coarse language was being discussed on national radio as I listened on and work. <laughs> what a bizarre experience. <laughs> Trying to make sense of how Jim Wells wanted Stephen Nolan to say, Electra cunt at half nine. <laughs> <laughs> this ridiculousness was because I dared to speak my mind and I needed to be stopped. Mm. Followed from both of these events happening on the same day, Drag Storytime and Alternative Queer Ulster, 
meant that attention was drawn to drag story time and what we were doing in the library. A member of the DEP, Nelson Paul, <laughs> made a public blog post about it, posting up pictures of the attendees, and suddenly the event felt no longer welcome at the library. Our queerness, our loudness, me. I had caused such an uproar by my mere presence at Stormont that I had potentially ruined something so joyous and so precious to me as dark story time. We were exposed, made to feel guilty for speaking our minds, telling our stories and reading books to children about acceptance and self-love. Not all attention is good attention, but we weren't big yet. So directly across the road from the library was an old bank building that had just become vacant and a group of very, very dedicated and hard-working volunteers got to the entire building and transformed it into a venue that could facilitate drag story time again. A feminist-ran queer space that was in the heartland of East Belfast is something <laughs> no one would have imagined. <laughs> but we were left with no choice. The calamity caused over me being able to express myself and my views freely was the catalyst for politicians to publicly attack me and put a threat to some of the work that I do. In order to continue doing what we do without restrictions, we have to have created our own space in order to survive. The 343, as it is called, is a building that can offer artists space to develop their work in conjunction with my own cabaret collective called Queertopia, now operating from the same centre too. We hold mental health days because the work that we do from that we see the aftermath of years of trauma from people's queerness. They come to us to be amongst their fellows and not be afraid of being othered, so that in that freedom they tell their stories. We hear of how they've been shunned from their families. We hear <coughs> of how terribly people in Northern Ireland have been treated by the system. Long waiting lists at the Gender Identity Clinic and a severely understaffed, overworked and underfunded <coughs> mental health system. You see, Northern Ireland has been left to rot. As of September 10th, figures from the Northern Ireland Statistics and Research Agency show that 609 people have taken their own lives in Northern Ireland in the two years since Stormont collapsed in early 2017. Between 2000 and 2017, a total of 4,476 deaths were registered to suicide in Northern Ireland. This is higher than the number of people killed in the Troubles, as Malachi was telling you. 28% of people who died by suicide in Northern Ireland were already known to mental health services, and 50% have been taking med uh, medicine for mental health uh, issues. It is estimated that around six people are intensely affected by a suicide death, and a further 60 people are deeply affected. On this basis, an estimated 42,000 people in the north of Ireland have been intensely affected by suicide since 1970, and around 10% of the population have been profoundly affected by suicide. Evidence indicates that the north of Ireland has high levels of, often untreated, post-traumatic stress disorder and other mental health disorders as a result of almost 40 years of conflict. Research into the effects of decades of violence has indicated strong evidence that experience of the conflict is associated with poor mental health, particularly depression and alcohol misuse. Some researchers have suggested a possible link between the conflict in the north of Ireland and relatively high suicide rates. The contention is that the increased rates of suicide since the peace agreements in 1998 are a result of a decline in social cohesion and social connectedness, which was a characteristic of the conflict period, coupled with high levels of mental disorders, which are partly the result of previous exposure to violence. There were over a thousand annual calls to Childline from children in Northern Ireland where suicide is the main reason for the call. Suicide rates are falling in the UK, in Northern Ireland they are on the rise. The Lifestyle and Coping Survey has shown that 10% of 15-16 to 16 year olds in Northern Ireland self-harm. Girls are three times more likely to self-harm than boys. The study highlights the crucial role of schools in supporting the mental health and emotional well-being of children and young people. Amongst the most vulnerable would indeed be the transgender community. However, the Education Authority says that it is not possible to reliably estimate the number of transgender pupils in Northern Ireland. As the Department of Education said it, it does not currently record any information on transgender pupils. 
A long-awaited follow-up scheme for the mental health in Northern Ireland was unveiled recently, Protect Life. The challenge for Protect Life 2 will be to substantially reduce suicide rates by 10% in 2024. In 2006, the first suicide strategy, uh, Protect Life 1's aim, was to reduce the suicide rate by 15% by 2011. This was not achieved, so the bar has been set lower from 15 to 10%. The aim is to save less lives in the newer scheme. The proportion of spend on mental health remains the lowest in the UK, estimated at around 8% of the total healthcare budget, despite the evidence of substantial levels of need. So the figures are there, and yet Northern Ireland still does not have any sense of hope that the problem is being taken seriously. Either in the new plans, the funding, lack thereof, or any public action taking place from the government. So we do not have a choice. When we are attacked for speaking out, attacked publicly by politicians for daring to tell our stories, when we know our friends and loved ones are taking their own lives in this epidemic, we have to create spaces in order to survive. We do this because we don't have a choice. We do this to empower ourselves and steady fast in the movement for queer liberation. We do this because we have been left alone to do it ourselves. We do this because we have choice. When people are at um, our events, they usually describe them um, as feel good um, to the point where it rejuvenates their energy. Um, so of course, before I leave you this evening, um, I would like everyone's energy to be rejuvenated um, for giving me um, a response of up and queers when I shut it. <laughs> in Northern Ireland, we just cut out of that, join me. We're far too busy. So, when I say up and queers, I would like you to shout up and queers back at me. Up and queers! Up and queers!